Good morning and early afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Meg Mason. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing here at HydroPoint. I'll be the moderator on today's webinar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded, so you will re all receive a link to the recording at the end of the session. Um, and should you have any questions at any time, please just ask them in the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. And let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our host today. His name is Ben Slick. He's the Senior Vice President of Business Development here at HydroPoint. So Ben, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Meg. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to join us. Uh, as way of background, for those of you who might be new to HydroPoint, we are a proven leader in smart water management. We've since 2002, we've been focused on helping our customers achieve water efficiency solutions. Our first set of products were around irrigation control. Um, with over 35,000 network subscribers, we've increased that penetration now to helping our customers figure out how to manage leaks and monitor flow in buildings and on sites, as well as just an irrigation solution. So we're a service provider that aligns our offerings with <clears throat> the desired outcomes of our customer and hopes to help them improve their efficiency and sustainability efforts. And so with that said, I want to, with great enthusiasm, uh, welcome our special guest today, Zachary Brown. Zach is the Director of Energy and Sustainability at CBRE. CBRE is the world's largest commercial real estate investment firm. Uh, Zach is a licensed, certified lead in AP and operation management professional and deep experience in implementing sustainability solutions over the years. Uh, he's managed sustainability initiatives on behalf of clients at CBRE, and he's also worked in real estate uh, for Equity Office. Zach, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So just to get us started, just give us a little of your background for the audience so they can kind of set into where you're going to go today. Sure, absolutely. Um, I started off in uh, property management as an assistant property manager about 15 years ago uh, here where I live and work in uh, San Francisco and then uh, joined uh, CBRE about nine years ago after um, in property management gravitating to uh, waste diversion and recycling and composting and then some of the energy efficiency measures we were doing and then uh, transition to doing uh, ESG and sustainability uh, as my sole um, focus for CBRE. So how did you get into the sustainability field in general? I mean, where did it start for you? So it's interesting, it really started by uh, jumping into our dumpsters at the site where I was assistant property manager and pulling out contaminants. Uh, we had a recycling compactor that had landfill going into it, compost with recyclables going into it. And uh, I was young and I was hungry and I was uh, looking for an opportunity. So I took ownership of the recycling and composting program at that site. And eventually people uh, in the industry just started calling me asking for advice on how to implement sustainability programs. And I figured I should probably uh, bone up on it a little bit and learn more and uh, became a subject matter expert on my own and uh, uh, was able to transfer that knowledge over to CBRE and take it full time. So when the book comes out, Dumpster Diver to Sustainability Superstar, I want an autograph copy, please. Yeah, that tra um, trade trademark, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the class of properties that CBRE manages and what your area of focus is for these properties. So CBRE is a very large uh, company uh, managing over 2.7 billion square feet around the world. Uh, my focus is actually uh, with just one of their strategic clients, um, which has a U.S. real estate portfolio around the United States. Um, I'm in charge of that particular client's portfolio, which is about 87 million square feet. But it's a diverse portfolio in all markets across the country, and we um, manage on their behalf industrial, retail, multifamily, and office properties. Great. So managing sustainability programs. Um, typically, that starts with a corporate goal or corporate mandate or target. Help us all understand what goes into setting those targets. Uh, sure, and that's a really good uh, starting point uh, for those new sustainability managers uh, definitely start with a goal, whether it's a goal that you're inheriting from a corporate mandate or starting your own goals. 
but definitely start small and manageable. Um, I would liken it to how you're setting your own uh, performance management goals for your own performance and uh, uh, review process. Uh, there's a term called SMART goals, which is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Um, and also consider your audience, uh, consider who you're quote unquote selling the goal to in terms of generating support with your stakeholders. Start with something that's easily communicate, easily to, easy to be communicated to stakeholders to get them on board and to understand where you're going with the goal. So <clears throat> tackling energy or gas or water, you know, what makes you choose one area of focus over another? So no offense to our host today, but I would definitely recommend starting with energy. Um, mostly despite being something we can't really see, it is the most quantifiable. It's the easiest to measure, the easiest to get data for, and also with some of the tools around energy uh, uh, benchmarking measures, it's much easier to communicate success relative to energy uh, goal setting and target setting to your stakeholders. So definitely start with energy. Okay. So benchmarking and setting a baseline for sustainability metrics is critical. Tell us why it's an important step and what do you look for in order to set those goals or those metrics? Uh, so this goes hand in hand with goal setting. Um, it's the other side of that coin. Uh, you can understand where you're going if you don't understand your starting point. Uh, in terms of benchmarking, I do want to stress the importance of getting your data of the highest integrity um, to make sure your benchmark um, is uh, well set and has a high integrity as well. Um, one of the, the tools that we use in our profession, which is a great starting point for benchmarking with energy, is uh, the EPA Energy Star Portfolio Manager. It's a free online software tool and it's really good in calculating energy and water baselines and basically the click of a button for any period of time. Um, so once you are certain that your data input going into Energy Star is of high integrity, then you're able to generate baselines both with water and energy uh, very simply through a third party, well-respected platform. So Energy Star is a platform um, and it competes with or is consistent with other platforms like NG or Ecova or you know any of a number of others like Measurable. You know, how do you determine as a sustainability manager which one to use and why? That's a really excellent question, and we can actually spend a great deal of time talking about that. But in terms of Energy Star versus a third party um, service such as NG or Measurable, Energy Star is the third party free platform uh, administered by the federal government. A company like Measurable is a private company that is more towards um, the actual data um, uh, aggregation analysis organization uh, portion of um, that. For my client, we actually do use Measurable as our third party data um, storage and organization uh, hub for all of our sustainability data. Um, and that platform helps direct energy and water data into Energy Star and Energy Star back into our analysis software. And I manage that process along with uh, uh, my team that, uh, that uh, does this on behalf of our client. Um, but some of these uh, companies such as uh, uh, NG and there's Gobi as well, um, have different flavors. Some of them have a little more of a uh, human component and consulting component to it, which for a, a sustainability manager, you really have to determine how much bandwidth do you personally have to do a lot of the data crunching and set up the automation and how much of it do you want to uh, hire a third party to do. Um, so the Energy Star Portfolio Manager, um, that's a tool and a third party company like Measurable that we use or some of the other ones that you've mentioned uh, is someone that you can hire to help streamline and optimize that process. And each company is gonna be different. Um, each uh, sustainability team, depending on how much uh, uh, help you have with uh, team members and other stakeholders, uh, greatly depends. Um, but we find great value, my client finds value in using a third party um, data, sustainability data management system 
to help us organize our data because we have a lot. So in many ways, you become the human component of the Energy Star platform for your client. Um, it's augmented by Measurable, but in a large part, you do a lot of that stick handling of data and program measurement for them. Uh, certainly, yeah, there certainly has to be a human component. Um, however, we do benefit greatly from the automation services that's provided both from Energy Star and our third party partner that helps us um, uh, automate and analyze and store and organize that data, especially. So when you step back then and look out across the portfolio of things to go attack for energy or natural gas or water efficiency improvements, there's so many different technologies out there and different solution sets. You know, what do you look for in a partner? Uh, so we're on a, on a similar topic from uh, question to question, but uh, I look for some someone, a, a technology partner that has the same emphasis on good data. Uh, us sustainability professionals drink from a fire hose of a lot of fly-by-night companies that offer, uh, you know, 30% savings just by installing this widget onto uh, your, uh, you know, air handling unit. And, you know, these silver bullet solutions are attractive, but um, if there's not a great emphasis on providing transparency to how they calculate savings, I'll move on to another um, consideration. Uh, a good partner, um, they'll take the time to gather good data from me, check on its accuracy, incorporate uh, necessary variables into the analysis to determine not only what the savings are, but what um, variables and what outside factors will actually contribute towards savings. And with this context and with this emphasis on providing real accurate, transparent savings analyses, you're not always gonna save. So I really appreciate it and it's refreshing to me to have that level of transparency from a technology partner if there's no savings there, don't lie to me. Tell me. Yeah, building trust is a major part. I think we uh, lost Ben. Can I, Ben, can you still hear me? You went uh, mute for a second. How's that, Ben? Can you hear me? Yes, got you back. Okay. I, th I missed the question. Would you mind? <laughs> yeah, no worries. So we're just basically saying once you've decided on a partner, what are some of the challenges you faced in the recommendations of best practices or other things to consider when installing or launching these new solutions? Sure. Um, we've had a lot of challenges uh, for sure. Um, actually, HydroPoint has been on a journey with us uh, for quite some time. Uh, one challenge is to when implementing a new technology or a new product or new approach is to go beyond what I call the, the magic widget mentality. Um, it's really tempting to go for a piece of technology, a solution, and set it and forget it. Um, in an ideal world, that, that would be great to have just install a product and leave it and let it accrue savings for you, but that's not always the case. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's usually variables that need to be considered to ensure that proper savings are being achieved. Um, you know, taking your controllers, for example, um, when my client first started to be interested in um, uh, this product uh, during the, the early days of the California drought about five years ago, um, we got the directive to look into this product and uh, we ended up, a uh, client ended up purchasing the equipment directly from the landscaper instead of going through HydroPoint to um, go through the necessary scoping and uh, get the necessary services in, a, in addition to the physical controller. And we discovered that Landscapers were just running the controllers in hand, like basic time clocks. And even though the client may have saved money up front from buying them directly and not buying your additional products and services, a HydroPoint saw these controllers on their system 
and reached out to us and said, uh, I think these are being run in hand. You really want to check these out. And here's a solution to get them um, brought into our performance management system so that you can verify if they're being run in the auto mode so that they're benefiting from the weather data service or if they're just being turned on and off. So we actually, with that intervention, were able to um, recoup our savings. If they had just been run in hand from that original, uh, those original first sites, we wouldn't have uh, benefited from those long-term savings. So having that, um, uh, that trust with a partner is really important and to uh, really troubleshoot and to keep your eye on your um, investments. Because like I said, you, it, it's, it would be great if you just set it and forget it, but um, yeah, you really have to keep an eye on those early sites. Yeah, because those early pilots will determine if you don't get results, whether you continue with the program or not. So yeah, exactly. Keeping hands on and eyes on is there. So um, you've done a lot of different kinds of programs across the spectrum uh, for your client. You know, maybe help us with some lessons learned on a project that didn't go quite as well as you'd hoped it would go. Sure. Um, one of the uh, areas that I would uh, uh, um, invite people to approach with caution is with LED retrofits. And this is a program where uh, we've been working on with our client to get to a scalable program. And we, ar we arrived at this program really from um, getting burned from, uh, from LED uh, distributors that offer a really low cost fixture, which is very attractive. Again, the, the upfront cost low cost fixtures can be very attractive but some of these distributors are selling products that have been sitting on a shelf in a warehouse for three years the company that manufactured them is no longer in business so when these fixtures fail and even the best fixtures will will fail for led uh, retrofit but when we had a really high failure rate we went back to the company that manufactured the lights they no longer existed so they couldn't honor a warranty and a distributor didn't offer a warranty on the labor. So LED can be a really attractive payback if you go for really low, low quality, low price fixtures. But I caution people to take the time and work with really reputable vendors, make sure the fixtures are of high quality, check for a warranty on the fixtures and the labor to make sure that that investment is actually going to maintain its value over the expected uh, life uh, time of the uh, installation and the investment. Really good points. Um, so, you know, WeatherTrack has become a well-defined solution in the water efficiency portion of your portfolio for your client. Um, now that that's been really broadly implemented across the asset classes, um, and you're starting to see results. Maybe talk about what makes a sustainability program repeatable across more than just one property, please. Sure. Um, so being able to have a collection of preferred vendors that the, the client trusts is a really important endpoint to get to. To get there, uh, you have to collaborate on pilot sites. Uh, again, going back to data, crunch the data, and be able to present both the opportunity for savings as well as the outcomes to your stakeholders and having that transparency of the data both pre and post installation is very, very important. Uh, to be able to hold your technology partners and vendors accountable when things go wrong, and I hate to break it to you, but things will go wrong, they always will. But once uh, trust is established, if the, the technology partner comes to the aid of the client, responds to crises, finds a way through, and uh, is able to uh, maintain trust uh, with the client is super important. Um, and once you have that trust, and once your client or owner uh, recognizes the value in a consistent program and a consistent group of preferred um, partners, then it's much easier to scale. Once uh, other, uh, for us as asset managers, once other asset managers see the savings achieved at another site and they see the investment and they see the return, they'll have that mentality of why aren't we doing this at 
every site. And here, um, for my particular client, now that we've had um, that established trust in place in our, in our group of vendors that we go to uh, consistently, we now review each and every property each year before budget season with asset managers and go line by line. Do you have irrigable land? Yes or no? If yes, do you have smart controllers? No, why not? If there's no reason why there's to, if there's no reason to not upgrade to smart irrigation controllers, or in the case of LED to upgrade to LEDs, we provide the pricing for their budget and we have them put them in their budget each and every year. And to have that, to, to go through the process of piloting and establishing trust and having your asset managers recognize, oh, that's the LED program, that's the smart irrigation program, that goes a long way. It takes some time to get there through pilot sites and um, uh, some trial and error. Yeah. So HydroPoint, like you have evolved our thinking about how we help our customer. Um, we started as being an equipment manufacturer and over time have really evolved our offering to be more of an outcome services company where we want to reach out to the customer. We want to we want to get on record as saying we think there's a problem before you call us and say, hey, there's a problem. They just there's more uh, trust when the provider brings you what they think could be the problem as opposed to hiding and pretending that it might not ever get discovered. So I, I think we learned a lot of hard lessons in our business about just being more proactive with our clients. And that's where our performance management services really, you know, yeah. come into play to help you proactively reach out to people to make sure they're getting the bang out of the buck that um, your investors and your asset managers are hoping for when they budgeted the thing. Um, so on that topic, you know, you've seen the deployment now of a pretty broad set of your know, water efficiency solutions and you've been experienced in implementing these programs at scale let's talk about what specifically were the bumps in the road with hydropoint and what were the things that made you confident we could overcome those uh sure uh we've touched upon a couple of them so far um but i do have a few more examples uh connecting back to what we we're talking about earlier with goal setting uh, one area where we saw an opportunity and uh, HydroPro was able to deliver on this was we basically went to you guys and said, hey, we want to set a goal just for our outdoor irrigation implementation projects um, and use your system, your performance management system to set the goal, to track the goal, and then to uh, uh, show that we actually achieved the goal over a course of the year. Um, and then with that technology, prove that the results were solved and that the goal was actually achieved. Um, so our goal with uh, collaboration, we arrived at a 15 million gallon goal for 2019 and just irrigation, outdoor, outdoor irrigation savings. Um, with this collaboration, we more than doubled that goal, which was great for my client. Um, but with just the flexibility to be able to take basically just a thought we had and said, you know, we really wanna do this, can you, technology partner achieve this for us with your existing tools and resources available to us. So to that end, let's just talk about some of the results. You've got stuff to brag about, share it. Yeah, well, there it is right there. Um, 37 million gallons instead of, uh, well, we, we aimed for 15 million gallons and that was a projection based upon our water use analysis reports for our both our existing properties that had the systems installed and our projected installations for 2019. Uh, clearly, these are good results. Um, and uh, this year, we're already on track to cruise past that 15 million gallons uh, again. But I just want to stress that these types of reports are a great tool to communicate success to our asset managers. We can show the actual realized savings, which is a huge leg up above um, over some other um, uh, providers that do uh, irrigation controllers. One thing that uh, I'm very keen on noticing is for uh, a typical irrigation controller, they're sold as we'll achieve 30% water savings, no rigor to the analysis, just across the board, you'll get 30% savings. We've done a lot of sites, it's not always the case, There's many variables that lead to uh, actual savings, but with our actual savings, which are measured 
through your system at the controller, we're at 35% aggregated savings across all 40 of our um, assets, which is not only does it show that this is exceeding what is a typical sales pitch for irrigation controller, we're above it and we can lean on those savings and we're confident in them and we can continue to deploy this technology at sites where it makes sense. So, you know, based on your experience and challenges managing different solutions in different energy focus areas, you know, what, do you, what would you say are some of the core ingredients and best practice for implementing any kind of sustain, successful sustainability program? Yeah, we definitely touched upon some of the high points here. Um, I would add just patience um, in troubleshooting your various approaches. Uh, not every site's going to save. Um, also, not everyone is going to be eager to come along on this sustainability journey with you. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll say uh, personally that some of our stakeholders that were initially skeptical of some of our uh, programs are now true believers. So definitely be patient as you troubleshoot um, and look to the data and uh, find your uh, trusted partners to, to help you and give you the uh, leverage to achieve those goals and to get to those goals. So as we close out this formal part of the webinar, and we're gonna move into Q&A here in a sec, um, just give the audience a last set of suggestions in regards to implementing sustainability programs. There's many folks that are very seasoned and others that are maybe new in the industry, you know, learning from you, what would you, what other tips and tricks would you recommend for them? Uh, sure, uh, it's another really good question. Um, I would offer to, don't be afraid to collaborate. Um, sustainability professionals in real estate, it's a relatively young industry. As I said, I started off dumpster diving, worrying about waste diversion and recycling. And now our niche in the real estate industry, we are responsible for energy, climate risk and resiliency, health and wellness. With COVID-19, that puts a huge uh, focus on health and wellness um, in buildings. Uh, uh, social and racial equity uh, falls under this broad umbrella of ESG and sustainability now. So it's a really niche and young industry that's constantly evolving. So never be afraid or hesitate to reach out to colleagues and collaborate, ask questions, uh, share best practices. You can still share best practices and uh, uh, keep a competitive advantage for your client and your ownership because, you know, you know, we're raising all the ships here, uh, but it's it's so new and it's moving so fast that um, we all have to uh, stay abreast of it and um, keep collaborating. So that might that'd be my advice: reach out, um, ask questions, and uh, share best practices as long as they're not proprietary. Right. Well, Zach, thanks. Um, I'm going to step back. I'm going to let our audience now pepper you with whatever questions have come in. Meg, would you lead us through that, please? Fantastic. A great uh, session so far. So just a reminder to anyone in the audience, um, in the GoToWebinar panel, there's a question section right there. So go ahead and type in any questions you may have. Um, we do have a couple so far. Uh, the first one is, I struggle with internal buy-in for sustainability initiatives. Do you have any suggestions for handling this? Yes, um, that's uh, always a challenge for sure. And uh, I've touched upon uh, being able to show uh, pre and post savings, uh, show case studies where it's worked elsewhere. Um, also to uh, really work with the budget. Um, if we're able to get these line items in, in, a, in an approved budget, it's a lot easier to uh, get them done. Another aspect is to consider broader appeals simply beyond uh, savings. For LED lights, uh, consider impacts to the aesthetics of the property, uh, reduction in labor to uh, replace fluorescence as LEDs last a lot longer, uh, marketability to the building, um, and those things outside of a normal uh, financial return model uh, certainly helps. Um, another uh, uh, lever piece of leverage is each year, investors are more and more interested in ESG and sustainability and finding ways to distinguish uh, their investments relative to uh, uh, ESG and sustainability profiles. And the more investors are asking about it, the more 
we, and when I say we, we as representing the client or stakeholders should be doing this. And that's not to say the best reason. We're, we should do it because other people are doing it. But if investors are asking us to do it and are interested in these outcomes, that's another reason to add to the pile beyond simple return and aesthetics and ancillary reasons to do it uh, to generate uh, interest and buy-in. Great answer. Uh, this on is actually topic, because of, Meg, there's one other question that relates kind of to this, which is, you know, sustainability initiatives for a large part drive operating costs out of the property, therefore improving net operating income. That translates to cap rate, which then helps the property asset owner improve value at exit. I mean, how much do you work with them to communicate the value of this and translate this to added asset value? Uh, that's another, that could be another half an hour discussion uh, for sure. Um, one of the things to consider is uh, the uh, investment in a energy or water savings technology doesn't always necessarily accrue back to the landlord, which is one of the reasons we concentrate on areas under landlord control, which is outdoor irrigation, common area LEDs. So that does have a very accretive um, uh, proposition for increasing NOI by reducing our direct operational expenses. When we deal with uh, sharing uh, both in expenses and operating and capital expenses with tenants, then it gets a little more complicated and we run models as far as how those savings accrue and uh, what sort of downstream savings we can appreciate as a, uh, a building owner. Uh, but that is, that is another basic thing if we just very basically, if we reduce our operating expenses, regardless of where those savings accrue, it does have an impact um, to the value of the building. Unfortunately, it's a completely different silo. I'm, I'm not involved with uh, dispositions, um, so I don't necessarily get to see the fruits of my labor, but it's certainly a selling point and another reason to um, invest in these technologies. Awesome. So this is a great actual segue to the next question is, Talking about return on investment or ROI, what is a good target ROI for a sustainability program? Is that something like a five years, three years? What do you look for? Uh, certainly another really good question. Um, and for some properties, there are, depending on the, uh, the, the ownership model and cash flow hurdles that I'm not necessarily privy to, that can change per property. But for, um, for what I look at, I really look at a five-year or less um, payback uh, for an implementation project. For a while, we're kicking around two, two and a half years, but with the um, with uh, LEDs and with our um, focus on high-quality fixtures that will last a while, we've looked, we've been a little more um, open to going more towards five-year paybacks. Uh, also, as more and more markets uh, have uh, electrical codes that require LEDs now, you lose out on a lot of the rebates. So those rebates are going away. So we're just purchasing the LEDs without necessarily getting a rebate, depending on the market. So we're going to have to look to those slightly longer paybacks. But to our core assets, where we're looking on a hold period, which extends beyond five years, we're still going to see a payback on our investment, and we are going to see that reduction in operating expenses. Uh, of course, two years is great, but for, for us, um, uh, five years is a good target to start with. And if we're under five years, um, it's definitely on the uh, it's uh, it's in our queue to sell to asset management when we do our annual uh, budget review. Got it. Um, one last question that just came in. Uh, what if our company doesn't have any capital budget for starting any of these sustainability initiatives? Do you have any suggestions for that? Another huge challenge. Uh, there are uh, ways to do unbuilt financing through utilities. Um, there are alternative funding methods, which is, again, a whole other conversation, and I'm, I'm not much of an expert there. So I'll instead focus more on ways to get to the capital uh, planning stage. One piece of advice that worked for me and that I found great success is instead of going for a full LED retrofit or a full 
um, irrigation control or upgrade, engage with those vendors and have them come in and do an audit, have them do a water use analysis. So at least in your hand, you have that thorough analysis of what the savings potential is. And that is something that you can take. And then for the next capital planning round, you have that already to go and you can sell it when the, um, the client is ready to consider the next round of capital funding. And you can include that in the next, um, in the next period, the next capital plan. Another thing to keep in mind as you're doing these analyses, having these assessments also bolsters your data gathering and your reporting cache if you're reporting to an entity like GRESP, having these in hand does uh, increase your um, uh, uh, number of assessments and gives you more data, more information for the, the savings potential uh, for your portfolio. So I would say start with just getting, getting engaged with vendors, finding those sites that will save, have those in hand so when the next capital round comes around, you're ready to go. Awesome. So we got a couple more questions coming in. Sorry, Ben. Um, first off, for water projects, to, do you also use soft savings like overall site appearance, reduced slip fall risk, landscape value, or property? Uh, that's a really good question. In our uh, goal setting and target setting activities, we stick to gallons and, and dollars to communicate. But definitely, I think I was touching upon this earlier as we uh, sell these projects and if we're getting uh, some pushback from uh, stakeholders, the soft sell does definitely come in hand, uh, especially with reduced, I mean, reduced leaks. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to talk much about this today, but the reduced leak, the, 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 the unlimited upside to preventing both a catastrophic leak, a slip and fall, wet cracked pavement, uh, uh, um, debilitated landscape features. Avoiding that is a huge upside to selling these water projects. And that definitely comes in handy when we're selling uh, these projects beyond that simple financial payback model. So it definitely comes in handy. Awesome. We got some great more questions coming in. Thank you everybody for posting them. Next is other than the installation of a smart controller, what other factors are included in your water management program to achieve the goals you have established? Another good question. So what's interesting there is the, we've actually started pretty broad and we started with just looking at landscape renovations, which the smart controller is a very small line item into a landscape renovation and we've done landscape renovations, which includes turf removal, uh, replacement of plants with more native drought resistant uh, plants, xeriscape features, um, and that move towards low water use landscape features. The controller is a very small line item as part of that grand um, uh, landscape renovation. To create a savings attributed to the entire landscape renovation, is very tricky and it's very difficult to really determine how much water you're saving by converting to Xeriscape. Ben's more of an expert here and I'm sure he has conversion factors, but for us, we started with looking at just determining payback and return and value to landscape renovations. But then we had the, the Eureka moment and we've switched, we've switched over to looking at just the, the investment irrigation controller and the controller infrastructure, which includes obviously the weather data, the leak prevention and monitoring devices, um, and the, uh, the master valve um, features to derive that direct financial payback. So we've actually started big and looked at everything, but didn't find, didn't find much value because it, we just couldn't get the, it wasn't as precise for our liking. So we've actually narrowed it down to looking at just the controller and that particular investment and the savings related specifically to that uh, component of the landscape renovation. Great. Uh, another question, what are the metrics that property managers are using, IRR or payback or both? Uh, so 
in my experience, and this, this will change from property manager to property manager, from client to client, um, IRR, uh, internal um, rate of return, it does come up, but really uh, we look at uh, payback and ROI as those top line um, uh, uh, most prevalent metric for judging uh, an investment. Um, personally, I've I've sold many projects on a short payback. I don't recall ever having an IRR that was especially attractive and the client um, going to that metric over payback. Not my experience. Uh, it could change for other uh, clients and ownerships, but my personal experience uh, uh, and people who are into finances and, and financial models will probably uh, uh, scream in frustration about this, but the payback metric is still um, really key, at least in my experience. Awesome. Another question. With real estate often seeing high turnover for contractors of property managers who may use new technologies, how do you manage keeping everyone engaged in using the tools effectively to ensure performance? Oh uh, man, another another really good question. Um, yeah, uh, we have a big portfolio. We have property, my client has property across the country. Uh, our property managers are very skilled uh, um, professionals that manage their properties. And they're not always going to, to pick our vendors. They're not always going to uh, give me a call when um, they have a project come up and they want to do an LED retrofit or an irrigation uh, controller upgrade. Um, however, it really can be a top-down approach, and that's that exercise of going through each asset manager's portfolio line by line um, with an asset manager first is an important um, activity for us because that if the asset managers queued in to our resources and our implementation program, then that usually goes down, gets pushed down to the property managers. Uh, but uh, to get the message out, uh, lots of case studies, lots of internal reports. We do a um, mid-year and a end of the year internal sustainability report, which highlights all of our successes with implementation projects um, and just constantly uh, uh, um, internal meetings, calls, being front and center. And I think it also is a testament to uh, CBRE and also my client that have uh, faith in, in me and my team to put us forward to other asset managers and to property managers as a resource that they can use. So it goes it goes both ways. I mean, it, it, if it were up to me, I wouldn't get as much done, but you know, CBRE and my client do a really good job of uh, promoting the work that I do and getting the word out that um, I am available to help out and that we do have um, technology partners uh, to help in our pursuit. Awesome, so we are getting um, close to end here, so I'll do one more question and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, last question is, do REITs expect their property management companies to help improve the owner's NOI and ROI? Short answer, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the the particular uh, my client's properties that are owned by REITs uh, that is a uh, strong motivating uh, factor when things come into play I mean this these past couple of months have been super challenging for um, for financial metrics and cash flow that's a huge concern and it's something that I have to work with um, however on the on the other side of that I thinking also in terms of investors and and a REIT is going to look to attract more investors to uh, 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 create a return for their existing investors and the work we're doing now even with all these challenges these uh, challenges will have long-term effects and will benefit the fund over time so that's another thing to consider I mean we have to deal with NOI for for sure um, but the investor is another huge component to working with a REIT and to determine what is of the highest value in terms of sustainability uh, investment for the fund. So that's another thing to think about as you work with these um, uh, uh, challenges to deliver on NOI. Awesome. 
Um, so great. So as uh, we wrap things up here, um, Ben and Zach, do you guys have any last minute comments before I wrap things up? I just want to thank Zach for taking time out of his schedule to share with our customers and our audience some of his best practices. Zach, thanks truly for taking the time to make us better. Yeah, thank you to HydroPoint for uh, allowing me to speak. And uh, for those that know me, I love speaking about and talking about this sort of thing. So as I said, don't be afraid to collaborate. Uh, reach out, ask questions, happy to answer them. Awesome. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. A special thanks again to Zach. His contact information is here on the slide. If anyone has any questions about HydroPoint or uh, anything for Zach as well, our contact information is on this slide. Um, also, I'll do a little plug for next week's webinar. It's on water use efficiency in energy service performance contracting. Boy, that is a tongue twister. Um, we are gonna be sending out a follow-up email after this webinar. We'll have a recording of today's webinar as well as a, a link for you to register for next week's webinar. Otherwise, you can go to hydropoint.com slash ESPC, all in lowercase. So other than that, thank you all for attending with us today. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.